the cloud. Uh, if you saw a prompt asking you about recording, please hit OK if you are OK with this meeting being recorded. Uh, hello, my name is Dietrich Ayala, and I work on the IPFS team, and I'm happy to welcome you all here to the monthly local offline meetup where folks who are interested in technologies that work offline may or may not use IPFS, but even discussing the use cases and application and needs in offline communities comes up regularly, a uh, loosely knit group of people with shared interests. Uh, today, I would like to welcome Arky, who is joining us from a place in the world where it's very late at night. So thank you for staying up late to talk, who will, will present to us his work in building offline knowledge centers. Arky, want to uh, say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, tell us what you're working on. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invite. Um, I am part of open source community for a very long time, and uh, I'm based currently based in Cambodia. And I work on in my day job is working on open data. But uh, I also work on a couple of social impact projects. And uh, I'm going to talk about one of those today. Our Arky and I met I think 2010, 11, yeah. 2010, yeah, in in Vietnam at a, a time long, long ago. But I think at the time you were doing, I got hooked up with you through some open source project, maybe through Mozilla or Ubuntu folks. Yeah, and you were true. you were doing some accessibility workshop in Hanoi. Yeah, I was, I was like, uh... this guy sounds awesome. I want to meet <laughs> this guy. Um, I think uh, you heard about me in bar camp, uh, a bar camp in Laos. And when you came down to Hanoi, you met me uh, for a fresh beer. Yeah. Uh, Terry, how, how do I need to do that? Is there anything special I need to do for that in the recording? You're muted. If you're looking at the Brady Bunch view, that's what will come in through on the recording. So just okay. press the Brady Bunch then, button for yourself. Got it. Okay, I put it on speaker view. Or do you want it on Brady Bunch view for the recording? Brady Bunch tends to be better. Right. If somebody shares, cool. then it'll still okay. do just that. Great. All right. All right, Arky, good to go. All right, let me figure out how to share my screen. Cool. Um, please let me know if you can see my presentation screen. We can, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so thanks for the invite. Uh, my name is Aki, and this talk is more about my journey uh, trying to bring education uh, to remote places where I was, I was living. It was my journey through uh, India, where I was born and raised, um, through Kenya, where I lived for a while, and, uh, and all the way to Southeast Asia, where I live and work right now. Um, I love libraries. I spent most of my school days living in libraries, and I have a strong uh, belief that uh, if we provide knowledge, children could uh, self-learn. Um, but, but the places where I live, it's not always, I call them resource-constrained countries, um, because uh, quite often it's it, we, we don't have access to broadband, access to even power. Um, and I, I worked for, uh, I was lucky enough to work for a lot of interesting projects. I was part of Mozilla for a long time, working on their localization team. Um, all through my work, I am a strong believer on the, the power of digital technology um, to, to bring um, equitable access, to make things equal for people. and. Uh, the project that I'm currently talking about is one such project. The design of the project was what I call resource driven. It's driven by what hardware I could find in a country in Kenya or in Cambodia. I look around and find what hardware is locally available and try to build a solution out of it. Um, uh, I'm always kind of designing uh, my solutions so I don't have to import stuff from anywhere. 
Um, so it's always driven by the resources that are available um, and the challenges that are available uh, that, that, that I face uh, on the ground. So one of the one of the challenges that I would quite often uh, see living in in Southeast Asia and uh, during my time in Africa is um, education is quite often is the only way for people to um, to make a good life for themselves. That includes me. Um, I had I was lucky enough to have very good education and I was able to um, uh, able to to make a good life for ourselves. And so I'm always looking at that. And this project is about trying to, do, trying to bring high quality education, uh, but making sure that, that it's openly licensed. So uh, quite often in most of the countries, um, even the textbooks are not open licensed, though it is made by the government. Uh, these textbooks are owned by private publications. So I'm quite aware that uh, it's really important to have educational content under open license. Um, and also, if we are building a solution, I try my best to use open hardware so we don't get into a lock in, uh, in locked into any kind of uh, vendors. Also, not just this solution is not just for students, it's actually for teachers as well, because uh, in most countries, teachers rarely get uh, um, uh, sort of refresher courses. Quite often, they never go to any refresher courses. So this, this kind of offline libraries is not only just for students, uh, not only just for, uh, but also for teachers where they can refer um, uh, to, uh, to the, to the uh, resources in there. Though this is primarily targeted for schools, but it, it could be also deployed in uh, places, uh, uncommon places like uh, uh, disaster relief camps, refugee camps, uh, and also sc uh, schools that, uh, community centers in certain uh, uh, not too well those places in a, in a big city. Um, so it's, uh, so the, the inspiration, the origin story of this whole thing goes back to this project. Uh, perhaps you have heard about the hole in the wall uh, project in India. Uh, this was uh, an experiment by uh, Sugato Mishra. Um, he noticed that the kids living uh, in a slum next to his office were, were uh, 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 could never had access to any form of formal education. So what he did is he literally um, made a hole uh, in, in, in the wall and put in an old Pentium computer uh, with a keyboard and a mouse that was accessed to thing. And it was just an experiment to see. Uh, these kids barely speak English. I mean, this whole computer is in English, but very quickly he realized that kids learned, they mastered how to open programs, how to launch a browser, how to uh, try out things. And then very quickly they started teaching each other um, this kind of uh, self-paced learning was, uh, until then, they were like, uh, it was always like, oh, children has to go to school. They have to stay uh, in a very structured environment and a teacher will um, impart the education and the children will learn. But the Hole in the Wall project has shown that given the right tools, given the right environment, children could learn uh, each other. So this was for me like one of the first uh, first uh, inspiration, and uh, I still encourage you. I think the project is still going on. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, I have a link down below. Um, moving to East Africa, this was a project called uh, Rural Internet Kiosk. Uh, this was done by a good friend of mine, and he designed this bought this kiosk. Uh, actually, it's a shop uh, that sells like smokes and milk and snacks, but Behind the kiosk are two computer screens. Um, uh, this is a Linux machine with uh, multiple screens, multiplex. Um, and, on the, and the internet was delivered through VSAT. This was before 3G had come to East Africa. And there's a solar panel that was uh, providing the battery, uh, the power for this whole setup. So um, those who could pay could actually access internet and they would uh, pay the shop the kiosk owner uh, uh, some money, but the children would use this resource for free. 
Um, I worked on this project. Uh, it was I did a little bit of integration uh, for this project, and uh, when uh, this was this was completely offline, and this was like really really inspiring. Uh, even today, about ten years later, people are still asking us like, "Hey, we would like to deploy these uh, machines in places like South Sudan." Um, right now, use of VSAT is no longer uh, required because we do have uh, pretty good 2G and 3G connections in some parts of Africa. So this was my first experience in trying to bring education um, offline. So since then, things have changed a lot. I'm going to switch gears here and talk about hardware. Um, one of the first successful projects that was done worldwide was the one laptop for a child project. This was not really a hundred dollar laptop, but that was the goal to have um, a, a inexpensive but rugged laptop that could be used for children uh, for it in schools. And this was really, really advanced for its time. It actually had two Wi-Fi cards and it was doing mesh networking, uh, which was super advanced. Like if it, uh, like uh, it, in a classroom environment, children could actually see each other avatar and they could actually collaboratively work uh, on this platform. So this was really great. But the challenge is making hardware is really expensive. It was really hard to sustain this, uh, this kind of model trying to build hardware. 15 years later, right now, um, the, what we use um, is we are, we are using these Raspberry Pis, which are single board computers. Right now, I just checked the prices. It's about like $30. And it has the same performance as the one laptop per child. Um, device. One of the reasons we are moving away from um, a laptops to uh, Raspberry Pi, which does not have a screen, which does not have a keyboard, is because of the proliferation of mobile phones. Now, this has changed everything. Um, this is uh, last year's um, stats of uh, mobile penetration in Cambodia, where I live. And I'm so shocked. Actually, Cambodia's population is about 13 million, but there are uh, there are more phones than people, <laughs> uh, which is kind of strange. But uh, it's not very uncommon. Like people have two or three SIM cards, so I guess that's the that's the thing. So the reason um, I'm looking at uh, providing digital libraries and educational interfaces through um, Raspberry Pi and through Wi-Fi is because. We now have mobile phones, and these are smartphones with three inches uh, touch screen and a Wi-Fi uh, built in. Not a lot of uh, storage capacity, but they can connect to a Wi-Fi uh, uh, connection nearby. So the, the, the mobile phone penetration has changed a lot um, in the educational technology space. This is the digital library that, uh, uh, that we have deployed uh, in uh, Cambodia and a few other countries. Um, on the left-hand side, the black uh, PCB that you see is a solar power charge controller uh, from, uh, I forget, it was, uh, um, I forget the name of the company that produces it, but that particular charge controller uh, is connected to a a car battery and a, and a large solar panel. Um, on the, the, the red box is a Raspberry Pi with a 128 meg gigabyte SD card that has all the learning um, material. And the white box is actually a Wi-Fi uh, router uh, that's running OpenWRT. Um, Raspberry Pi has a onboard Wi-Fi chip, but uh, it it is not powerful, it is not reliable. Um, so if you, it can connect to 10 clients, but as more clients uh, join the network, it just drops and it consumes a lot of power. Um, when I talk about challenges of building such libraries, um, Wi-Fi is, remains one of the biggest challenge. Um, the good thing is uh, all of these devices uh, could be run um, using a, a power bank that you use to charge your mobile phone because the chip that is the, the board that is in your phone is actually the same arm chip that's running these devices so the power the power consumption 
remains very, very low. How do you access this? Um, so on this device, we have a Django application running. Um, uh, this application is called Colibri. Um, it is, um, uh, it's, it, it, uh, it's, it runs on the Raspberry Pi and uh, you can see the interface uh, you could, once you join this Wi-Fi network, um, it will point you to um, a, a series of mock style courses. So you can choose um, whether you want to learn through Khan, Ac Khan Academy or uh, you want to learn about um, uh, how to deal, teach us how to deal with uh, bullying in schools. So it is self-paced, self-learning, um, and you can also download stuff. So there is, you have some storage on your phone. So quite often you could go uh, when you're in school or in a community space, you could access the, access the content, download it, and you could, um, uh, you could view it when you're uh, back home. One of the most important thing about this kind of environment is uh, in this classroom environment, the teacher, uh, you have to follow the pace set by the teacher. But um, in, in a learning environment like this, some kids who are smart could go through the material really quickly, but others who would need a little more, they can learn in their own pace. So it is a, it's, a, it's very adaptable learning. So um, this, this is uh, some of the volunteers in Cambodia teaching the kindergarten teachers how to access it. Uh, we are trying to develop a lot of local content, um, videos and music, so they can be used uh, in kindergartens and primary school. Um, this particular device actually has about 100 gigabytes of content from Khan Academy uh, to offline Wikipedia. So if somebody is learning about where is uh, Florida, they could actually go and uh, search and read a Wikipedia article about Florida, either in English or in Khmer, uh, if they, the, the article has been uh, made. So um, to sum it up, this is off offline knowledge hotspots that basically are a, a way to deliver contents offline, but also try to create a learning environment that could be uh, very self-paced. We, we have deployed this um, and ran it for about an year now. Um, unfortunately, right now, due to COVID-19, the schools are closed until November 2020. So, um, so uh, I, it's, the schools are closed, but the devices are still running, I hope. Um, we have found out that, mo that we had very little problems, except one solar panel, which was faulty, which is poor quality, we had to replace, but otherwise it was running. Uh, this library is also fixed in schools, but we also have a mobile um, tuk-tuk or a small um, uh, three-wheeled cart that goes around different schools. And we have tablets uh, in the tuk-tuk, uh, so uh, children in the communities could actually borrow the tablet, do an activity or watch a video or use their parents uh, quite often we see they borrow their parents' uh, uh, phones and trying to access it. Uh, the next step for, for us is to have a lot of local content uh, on this on these devices. It is really important for us to have all of this offline, off-grid uh, quite often because the schools themselves cannot pay the power bills. I mean, they have some power, uh, they do have power in schools, but quite often they don't have budget to pay so quite often there is like no uh, power. So we, uh, we built the device in such a way that um, it will last for three days without uh, being recharged. So the challenges. Now this is where, uh, this is where I would love to have um, IPFS community help us. Um, Colibri, the software that is running uh, in the libraries have some P2P system. So they're, they're thinking about adopting IPFS. Um, the implementation is, has still hasn't happened. Um, so from the hardware side, I found there is no Wi-Fi device on any of the SOC boards, whether uh, it's Raspberry Pi or um, um, the, the 
imports from Olimex or any of the uh, banana pie and all these variants, the, the Wi-Fi chip is quite often very unreliable. It does not scale. Um, it uh, quite often it, 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 it consumes so much power that uh, it becomes unreasonable to use it um, on a solar setup. So right now we have to use a OpenWRT um, device, which actually somehow is much more power efficient and it scales to more than 50 uh, clients uh, per device. And also we could do a mesh network where we could actually extend the, the reach of the uh, digital library to the whole village by uh, using a mesh network. So um, that makes it uh, really powerful. So it is really, uh, at, when building this system, I had to use a lot of hacks because um, unfortunately you, you cannot have a captive portal. Um, I don't know if you know what a captive portal is, but if you're in a hotel or at the airport and you connect to Wi-Fi, you get this splash screen, which is called the captive portal. Um, interestingly, Captive Portal relies on DNS. So if you're doing deployments like this where there is no DNS, Captive Portals don't work. So one of the tricks that we, we use is called, uh, the, it's, it's called a DNS black hole where we are basically listening for the requests and sending them to our locals, local server. Um, we, it's, a, it's a hacky way, but um, this needs to be replaced. DNS should work. Service discovery should work offline. I say should because it's absolutely needed. Um, mobile devices, um, primarily we are looking at Android, but um, have Apple iOS devices as well. At the moment they hit a captive portal, they, are, they check for, uh, they do something like call back home um, where they check if this device is really connected to internet. Uh, if it doesn't, the new Android and iOS, they actually drop the Wi-Fi or they give a message saying like, oh, sorry, if there is no internet on this Wi-Fi device, I will not connect. Now this becomes an issue. So uh, quite often we, until, until now we were doing like some kind of trying to fool the system to show that yes, we are connecting to google.com, but uh, to do it, uh, but in newer devices, it's no longer possible to do it because they use HTTPS and it's not really possible to fake HTTPS requests. Once you connect to the, uh, once you have connected to the DNS, you have a captive portal, um, you have to come out of the captive portal to a web browser so we could redirect you to our learning materials. Uh, this captive portal handoff really doesn't work because when you're doing captive portal, both iOS devices and Android devices give you, give you a iframe, which is not re really a true browser and they don't allow us to fire up a browser. So this whole onboarding experience is really hacky and it's really difficult, especially when you're, when you are, when you're trying to deploy it in somewhere where um, people don't have experience in technology before. Um, so it becomes a bit of an issue uh, to successfully do it. To do to the deployment of this um, system, someone needs to have a <laughs> good internet connection. So if I'm doing this in Haiti, I need to find someone who has a really good internet connection in Haiti to actually download all the material first and then copy it off to the SD, uh, the SD card and uh, deploy it. So um, it, is, it is really dependent on having someone on the ground with good internet connection to do the deployment. And also when you are, um, when you are watching videos, uh, there is no mesh network. So there's a lot of load on the system, um, especially when you are broadcasting videos, it becomes a really um, an issue. So, uh, it's really, it would be really fun to actually look forward to a day when we would have some kind of PWA, um, uh, IPFS powered system where um, uh, videos could also be sent through the network uh, than coming from this uh, device. Solar power is um, the, the largest portion of the deployment cost. Um, the board, the Raspberry Pi and the, the, the um, access point 
they are very inexpensive. Uh, even the SD card is only like $15 now, but the solar panel itself is $120. Um, and in some places it's even $200 and they don't last for a very long time. So um, for these kind of deployments to work, actually solar power should become more accessible and more reliable. And I hope uh, it's getting cheaper, but uh, I hope uh, the prices will drop so we could, uh, we could do more uh, deployments. Um, future, um, we are all waiting for the COVID-19 um, to go away. Uh, to, uh, schools are closed, so we can't do any more deployments uh, anymore. Um, but that, the plan was before COVID-19 to expand this to former schools and to have a lot of local language learning material. Um, myself, I'm trying to design, if you're a product, if you have some experience in software engineering or uh, hardware manufacturing, I would love to talk to you because um, it's possible to shrink this package into one small device. Um, all you have to do is unpack this device pop in an SD card with some content and it should be ready to go. Um, and that's the vision I would really love to have. But right now I don't have the resources or the technology um, and the skills to make it happen. There you go. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for coming and speaking. Uh, People are figuring out how to use the, the clap response in the chat. <laughs> uh, that that was fascinating, and uh, I, I think there's a there are a number of questions in the chat. Uh, the first one there is whether or not there are media playback speed controls in some of these self guided learning systems. Um, can you repeat that? media playback speed control. So people's ability mm -hmm. to determine the speed at which the media is played back fast or slow. Um, yeah. Also probably the rate at which they're going through learning materials, it seems like would be relevant as well. Yeah, um, I, it's using a browser media player with uh, the rate control. Um, but so I think I would say it, I saw people actually asking for captions um and uh, so for khan academy uh the content is localized and captioning is there and people actually use play this in 1x and 2x so i've seen that happen uh, most often people are downloading uh, content uh D daniel asked what what the os is on the router whether it's a standard or a custom os i think you said open wrt but did you do any tweaks to it so it's running open WRT out of the box. Uh, the only tweak I had was related to Captive Portal. Um, it just uses an IP tables uh, hack to capture and redirect. Uh, Lewis had a question about the voltage and wattage requirements for the panels. Oh, I don't have... Um, I don't have the numbers out of my head, but I could, uh, if you drop me an email, I would share, uh, share the process. Yeah, I think that actually, if you could uh, just drop a comment on the, on the issue where we filed the meeting, that'd probably be a good place because everybody yeah. who found the meeting could also see the answer to the question. Uh, there was another question. Are there tools to facilitate the collaboration of captioning like web VTT? Um, so, not yet. So uh, that's something um, that's something that needs to be done. It's usually right now we are doing it offline or using a web service, but uh, it's not built into the system yet. Um, so Colibri is an open source software. So um, you're welcome to give a pull request uh, for that. And I will share the presentation uh, on the issue. Perfect. Fantastic. Right. Thanks. I had a question about Colibri. Uh, mm -hmm. do, you, do you bundle the, does Colibri have distributions and releases that have content bundled in? Or do you on these devices, 
install Calibri and then like dump everything onto all the media and content onto SD card? How tightly coupled are those systems? Um, so they have a service worker sort of thing that actually pulls uh, zip files of uh, Colibri uh, uh, servers. Uh, what I did for another project called Internet in a Box was I used BitTorrent. Um, so it tries to pull uh, using BitTorrents instead of using HTTP. Uh, it takes forever to, to download content, uh, both during deployment time, but also I would love to have when, when you have people who have already downloaded content on their mobile phone. It will be nice to actually send packets laterally than coming from the server. And also updates. Now that's another thing. Um, the way this system is updated is by swapping SD cards. Um, so I'm working on a system where uh, when a mobile library goes um, to a school, it could talk to the system and say, hey, I have some new files. Would you like to update your database? And uh, that kind of P2P syncing would be really lovely to have. But once again, I don't have anyone to code it. <laughs> so if you know a little bit of Python and JavaScript, uh, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, Lyle, this is the the uh, the unzipping as reading is reminding me of some of the work around offline Wikipedia, uh, looking at service workers to be able to get updates, uh, unzip and and make re render readable on the fly. It's yeah. a comp complicated system. Yeah. So Kivix was the project based out of uh, Mali that did it, and they used a format called Zim, uh, which was a zip format. Um, but uh, the idea is to actually have an open system so that could, uh, and right now, web videos are, videos are the most large content that needs to be uh, synchronized. And there is no good solution for that. I think, uh, um, yeah, so like putting Zim's, uh, those like offline snapshots of big Wikimedia uh, websites such as uh, Wikipedia uh, in different languages is something we've been uh, experimenting recently. And uh, the recently, uh, the, you mentioned the upgrade mechanism right now is based uh, mostly on swapping SD cards. And that gave me an idea that we have, uh, like if we start thinking about introducing IPFS somewhere uh, for uh, things like that, uh, we we don't we 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 cannot assume there will be actual connectivity in place to do the update of uh, bigger uh, corpuses of uh, data. Uh, however, in a recent Go IPFS release, we had this import export. Uh, functionality added where uh, data that was previously like properly chunked uh, into smaller pieces and uh, imported to IPFS repository um, that internal format can be exported to a car file which is sort of like a zim and that can be just put on a SD card and then in a different place just imported to IPFS node. So that's sort of like a sneaker net approach uh, to distributing bigger uh, data sets that are already on IPFS. However, where there's no networking that could handle uh, transfer in a reasonable time. Um, I find this uh, interesting to explore, explore that. Um, yeah, fantastic. I would really love to talk to you about it uh, offline. Uh, Arky had a question also about the, just how, you, how you're finding. Are you working with um, local organizations to be able to find schools that are, would accept these types of deployments? Uh, are you partnering with organizations? Or are these just uh, personal relationships you have? Um, so, I partner with local organizations that uh, are uh, they, that have long-standing relationship with schools and the Ministry of Education. Um, so that kind of uh, makes it makes it possible. 
uh, for me to bring this technology. Um, most of the open source projects uh, in, fail because uh, uh, there is no long relationship. Once the technology stops working, uh, the project dies. Um, what I'm trying, always trying to do is, is there a project on the ground that is doing work with teacher education or empowering children uh, or working with refugees um, and try to sneak this technology into it? Uh, lately, since COVID-19, people are actually approaching me because uh, this, uh, I designed this for offline world, but uh, with the current epidemic, we ha have people realizing that this is a need that's there on the ground. Um, so, the, um, right now I'm trying not to scale this, but try to figure out all the challenges that I'm facing, um, trying to address them. Uh, it's really hard to deploy these things because we need to train people to deploy uh, these devices. I had any, any other questions for Arky? Uh, by the way, Lewis is dropping some some interesting notes and and links in the chat as well. Yeah, sorry, I I, I didn't use the voice chat. Um, I, no, no worries. Can I ask a question out loud, or is it best? Yeah, to put it in? yeah, absolutely. So, um, with the content, uh, sorry, the open content. Tried to combine two words, they went horribly. Um, how are you finding uh, the challenges of getting like content? From, producers to to uh, license that in a way that protects their interest because obviously it's very difficult to create engaging and useful content but also enables projects like this to succeed without being strangled by the costs of you know every content creator wanting to be paid twenty dollars per view that's a great question um <laughs> uh there is no easy answer but uh, i'm relying on existing content um, that comes from One Laptop Per Child project and uh, Khan Academy and Wikipedia uh, to be try to get these open licensed uh, content. And Colibri already does the curation, so we are pulling from uh, those uh, those repositories right now. The content that is that we are producing, we are trying to um uh force people to open license it because in in cambodia for instance uh, most of the content development is funded by eu or one of the large funding organizations and lately they have been stipulating that if you use public funding for developing content it is recommended to kind of release them under open license so that is uh, one kind one way of uh, ensuring that uh, people would release uh, content um, that is open for all. Um, but the challenge is it's really difficult. Um, the, the trend is either to package all the content they develop into an app and release it uh, on App Store. Uh, and that kind of lock-in always happens. Uh, and it's really hard for us to, to kind of change that mentality. But using funding as a kind of a weapon to open uh, uh, knowledge basis is what we are trying to do. Uh, but if you have some things, some ideas that are working in Argentina or uh, in Ecuador, I uh, would love to hear and try them out in this part of the world. Any other questions for Arky? So, um, so Py, Pygen, uh, we use Pygen to, to create our bundle. So if you have people who have experience with that, I would love to talk to them. I uh, have a whole bunch of requests along that. Yeah, maybe in the uh, um, an issue for the meeting in the repo, drop a, both, I think, your asks and uh, links to for folks to learn more. I think that'd be great. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. It was fantastic talking to you all. Thanks so much Thanks for joining for us. Appreciate it. This is a great one. Nice to see you all. Uh, we'll probably have another one of these in another month. Uh, so yep. feel free to join if you have a topic you'd like to share on and speak about.
uh, whether it's a, a formal talk or even just a conversation topic or something you have a question would like to learn more about, discuss with the group, feel free to add it to the agenda and we'll pretty soon here post a new comment in that issue for next month's meeting. Thanks a lot.